So I will start off by introducing David Peaty, who is going to be the first presenter tonight. He has been working to raise awareness and share knowledge around the issue of socially responsible banking and investments since 2016. He has been working with a broad coalition of groups, including Indivisible Berkeley's economic justice team. So with that, I will pass it over to David. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having us here. Um, I, I actually am in book publishing. That's what I do for my work day. And way back in the day, I had a brief consulting gig at Sierra Club Books and just love work, working on those books. So I'm glad to be continuing my engagement with Sierra Club. Um, so I am just an average guy. I'm not, I don't have a background um, in banking or finance or anything, but back in 2016, when Indivisible fired up, um, they broke up into different teams and I was engaged with the economic justice team because I was really interested in <clears throat> uh, figuring out how to um, get the city of Berkeley divested from Wells Fargo. And that is not an easy thing to do. And the good news is uh, tonight we can talk about our finances collectively here, and that's a much easier thing to do in terms of getting our money out of the big mega banks and getting them uh, into financial institutions that are going to be um, investing our money in ways that really reflect what our values are, um, and specifically around environmental issues. And Sandy with Fossil Free California is going to really be focusing on that part. Uh, <clears throat> and what I'm here to do is really um, talk a little bit and tell tell some stories <clears throat> about the process that I personally have gone through. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight is the importance of <clears throat> being um, kind of public um, with what you're hoping to do if you are going to be moving uh, your money from Bank of America, Chase Bank, or whatever into a, a more um, socially responsible, environmentally responsible financial institution. And it's an odd thing for a lot of us because we were raised, you don't talk about money. You don't talk about money with your neighbors. You don't talk about it with your friends or your colleagues at work. Um, and I think that's really changing as people understand the important role that money plays in <clears throat> getting us to the point where we are today in this cl uh, climate crisis. Um, <clears throat> so I would encourage you all to sort of reset your thinking about how you engage with the rest of the world around this kind of thing. And I wanna share a couple of stories, um, uh, personal stories around this. So <clears throat> I'm, we have a wonderful little neighborhood group here in my neighborhood. It's about 50 homes. We all collectively um, pool some amount of money for things like disaster preparedness, things like that. We have a little block party once a year and we you know, have a bank account, <clears throat> um, three to $400 at any given moment, right? little tiny amount. Uh, and I said, hey, you know, it's sitting here in one of these mega banks. I think it's really important that we move it. Let's move it to a credit union. And everyone's sort of like, is it really worth the trouble? It's like, you know, three to $400. That's, that's seems silly. And I said, I'll, I'll go through the effort of, of doing it. Um, you know, I've done it for my personal, and I've done it for my businesses. So I'd like to do it. But the important part was I had this conversation with everyone at block parties, at disaster prep meetings and that kind of thing. And <clears throat> I was gonna say last year, but last year is sort of this amorphous thing. I don't know how long, I think it was 2019 actually. One of my neighbors came up to me and said, hey, I wanted to let you know that um, I'm on this <clears throat> commission for the city of Alameda through my work, the transportation commission, um, and they actually have a lot of bond money <clears throat> and they were trying, they were about to, you know, start basically put it in Bank of America. And I said, hey, hey, no, 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 no. Um, we should put it in a socially responsible bank. That was uh, $350,000. So my little conversation that I had with my neighborhood group around a $300 bank account had this ripple effect um, that I think a lot of us don't understand um, how we as individuals can can impact this amazing you know, large um, you know GNP of money pooled in these mega banks, but you can have a little effect like that, and then hear every once in a while. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not even hearing of all the stories, but every once in a while you, you hear back that actually that little comment that you made had a much bigger impact than anything you could have guessed. Um, similarly, I'm on a board of a of a nonprofit that has about twenty five thousand dollars 
that also is moving its money into a socially responsible bank. And we'll talk about all those kind of steps and those um, that process later on. Um, but I just wanted to share those stories because one of the steps at the very end is <clears throat> basically letting the banks know what you're what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think also letting everyone else around us know, um, I think is really important. So I think all of us are here tonight because we know that this, this is important to us. Um, but I think it's also really important to understand that we can, you know, have it go way beyond this Zoom room um, if we really share our experiences. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce Sandy, who's gonna talk a little bit um, about the, the myriad reasons uh, for why we should be thinking about moving our money away from some of these really problematic financial institutions. And Sandy, I'll let you do your own bio if that's okay. She's a good friend, but she's also got a good record as a, uh, all the activist work that she's done. Oh, you're muted. I've been with uh, Fossil Free California for a few years now, and our uh, main campaigns are trying to get the pension funds to divest from fossil fuels. So imagine my delight when I started working on bank campaigns where you can actually get individuals to move money and it actually moves. Uh, it's very interesting to realize the power you have over your money, both in banking and investments, but especially in banking because um, most men, you know, lots and lots of people have a banking relationship. Uh, I came to Fossil Free California after a career as a technical writer. And it, during the course of my work at a software company, I got some investments. Uh, after I left that business, I looked at my investments and I realized that they were invested in lots of things that no longer aligned with my values. I had investments in the Keystone Pipeline. I had investments in Boeing. I had investments in you know, this, that, and the other. So I started to clean up my portfolio and got involved with Fossil Free California to teach people how to look at the, the, their investments and later got into looking at my banking. Um, as Liz said, it's interesting when you're thinking about your banking, because if you don't move your money, if you're banking with a Wall Street bank or any bank, really, the bank will move it for you. Uh, banks only have to keep a certain amount on deposit. And the rest, they can loan up to 10 times for projects of their choosing. The Wall Street banks, Chase, Citi, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and so forth, are lending to fossil fuel projects. They're lending to fossil fuel companies uh, who are doing exploration and drilling. They're lending to pipeline projects. So they're enabling the fossil fuel industry. Let me share my screen and I will show you a couple of things. Mm -hmm. This is just a matrix of the money over which you have control more or less. You do have direct control over your checking, savings and credit cards and um, you know, partial control over your mortgage and your loans and so forth. The reason that investing in fossil fuel companies is particularly hazardous to the health of the planet is that fossil fuel companies business model is to constantly increase the size of the fossil fuel reserves. That's their entire uh, it, I call it the logic of the cancer cell. They just want to keep growing. And uh, at this point, fossil fuel companies have identified 
probably seven times the amount of reserves as can possibly be monetized. We can't afford to turn these reserves into fossil fuel products and burn them. Uh, it will certainly be the death of the, of the planet. So Van Jones liked to say that fossil fuel companies have the, uh, have the practice of digging up dead stuff and burning it. And so we need to keep it in the ground. We need to cut off the flow of money to the fossil fuel industry and to pipelines. The bank exit movement started with the economic downturn uh, back in 2008. And people realized that they were just furious at what banks had been doing with their money. And it continued through the Occupy movement. Uh, people uh, quite regularly uh, love to hate big banks because of what the banks do with your money. But banks is, I mean, banking is a really personal relationship and it's not easy to change habits. Um, the real impetus, the, the, the explosion of the bank exit movement came with the uh, protests over the Dakota Access Pipeline. A bunch of researchers, including the Sierra Club, Food and Water Watch, Rainforest Action Network, and so forth, put together the connections between big banks and the project managers and companies that were building the Dakota Access Pipeline. And people started exiting those banks and taking pledges and you know the pledges added up to about $15 billion in individual capital that was withdrawn from banks. Since then, bank protests have continued because banks continue to loan to fossil fuel companies. As well as fossil fuels, big banks invest in firearms, tobacco, nuclear power, private prisons, and so forth. This is their, it's their model to sort of support everything. With fossil fuels and environmental issues and uh, social governance issues, some of the banks have begun making pledges to change their oily ways. But for the most part, they haven't followed through with drastic actions. This is the report that comes out every year that gives us a real picture of the banks in rank order and their lending to various forms of fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuel exploration, digging up extreme fuels, tar sands, uh, deep ocean drilling, Arctic drilling, Rainforest Action Network and the other nonprofits really put it all together in, in a wonderful report. There was a, some downturn in bank lending to fossil fuels just before the Paris Agreement. They thought, and you know, if you had stopped at that point, you would have thought, oh, there's hope. But immediately after the Paris Agreement, banks resumed their lending to fossil fuel projects, including a 76% increase in lending to tar sands. J.P. Morgan Chase, which has been called the Doomsday Bank by Bill McKibben, leads the pack in terms of expanding fossil fuel funding. Altogether, at this point, banks have uh, put more than $2.7 trillion into fossil fuels. The top four banks funding fossil fuels are J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, City, and Bank of America. This is from uh, the Re uh, Rainforest Action Network report from last year. JP Morgan Chase leads every other bank in cumulative funding since the Paris Agreement, since the Paris Agreement by 36%. There have been lots of campaigns targeting Chase. They're starting to get slightly sensitive about their reputation in the world 
but they're still lending quite a bit to fossil fuel projects. So what can you do? Well, the first thing is to set your intention. This is your money and you can move it. There's really high concentration in the banking industry. The four largest banks control almost half of the $14.3 trillion in deposits. So when you move from one of the big banks, it's significant and every move counts. You can move to credit unions or socially responsible banks. There are banks that deliberately do not lend to fossil fuel projects and have various other socially worthy uh, constraints on their lending practices. There's Beneficial State Bank, which is a brick and mortar bank in Oakland. Patrick's gonna talk about that. There's the Self-Help Federal Credit Union, which has Oakland offices as well. And then there are online banks like Aspiration and Amalgamated. The thing about credit unions is almost any credit union is going to be pretty much um, okay to bank with. They tend to loan to local businesses to um, the, invest in vehicles and houses, mortgages, that kind of thing, or small farms. They are uh, can legally a nonprofit entity. They tend to be a relatively safe bet. And credit unions are in a network. Your savings and checking will be insured just as they would be with a regular bank. And you can bank with any credit union as if it were your home branch. The ATMs are all on a network. You can use them for free. And so lots of credit unions are within reach. The socially responsible banks like Beneficial State Bank go a step further. Beneficial State Bank, for example, is a B Corp. And Patrick's going to describe the benefits of a B corporation. It goes beyond just being a nonprofit. It, it plows its profits back into local projects. One thing that's on the horizon um, that may come to Los Angeles this in, in the next couple of years is a public bank. In 2019, uh, California passed a public banking bill making it possible to establish a public bank that would be owned by the state of California or another local entity, governmental entity, and would be able to uh, keep the money in the community. There's only one public bank in the U.S. right now, and that's the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, but public banks have uh, been a very popular cause for nonprofits in California, so I expect we'll see one in the next couple of years. There's another new bank, a, a digital bank called um, Atmos, they're sort of, I don't mean digital, I mean a, a virtual bank. They don't have an office. Atmos is coming online soon, and we list them on our website on the Move Your Money page. I'll just say one more thing about banking. All, all of the credit unions, the socially responsible banks, the digital banks, they will give you a debit card. Your credit cards, though, are backed by either a Wall Street bank or a, a non-Wall Street bank. If they're not backed by your credit unions, there's only a couple of banks that you can find. I found um, TCM Bank and they offer this Amazon Watch credit card and they used to offer the Sierra Club credit card. Now they offer Charity Select TCM Bank is not using your merchant fees and annual fees, if any, to support the big bank that supports that credit card. So you might think about where your credit card is, uh, how your credit card is supported when you're looking at moving your money. 
I'm going to introduce Patrick Costello now, who is with 350 Marin, and he's also on the board of Fossil Free California. And he'll talk about the bank exit campaigns of 350 Marin and a particular bank that he has experience with, uh, Beneficial State Bank. Take it away, Patrick. All righty, thank you, Sandy. Hello, folks. Uh, thank you for inviting us tonight. And as Sandy said, I'm uh, on the steering committee for 350marin.org. And we also provide, um, I, I kind of lead the campaign that we call a divest invest. You know, if you divest, you have to think about the invest part just as well. That's the other half of it. And we're also the folks that are used by uh, 350bayarea.org. And just to make sure you folks know um, the Fossil Free California website, Fossil Free freeca.org. Um, there's lots of information on these 350 sites and on the Fossil Free California site. Um, so this is a flyer that we developed. We, we have two flyers. We have one that addresses the banking challenge, and this is it that you're looking at now. And, and we're actually about to update it. We're going to, there's always, you know, the bank, banking industry is typically in flux, uh, one bank gets acquired by another one. So we update this you know, every six months or so. Um, we have a second flyer that talks about uh, the financial divestment process, how to make sure that your personal investments in things like mutual funds and exchange traded funds, stocks and so on, are not with fossil fuel related companies. And that's not that easy to determine sometimes. Uh, but this is that's a topic for a complete separate event. So I, I'm not going to go any further in that particular direction. Um, but I wanted to lend my voice, uh, kind of echoing what David said. It's I think it helps when we communicate to talk about personal stories. So my personal story about moving my money from Bank of America that I'd been with for so long, um, I'm happily to admit that it didn't happen immediately. It took time. You know, you have to, you kind of need to look at a whole list of the auto, automatic payments that are coming in, the automatic payments that are going out. So my process was um, kind of deciding what bank I wanted to move to, which in my case turned out to be Beneficial State Bank, which I'll talk about in more detail soon. Um, and so kind of the first thing was I ordered new checks and I started to train myself to use that checkbook instead of the Bank of America checkbook. And then I almost set like a monthly goal of tracking down at least one automatic inbound or outbound payment that I could change from Bank of America to beneficial state. So it took me a while. And we also freely acknowledge that there can be challenges around things like mortgages. It's not you can't just move a mortgage from one bank to another. And of course, banks are always clever to offer incentives. You know, if you're if you keep a mortgage somewhere, maybe they'll pay you another couple of basis points, a couple of you know, minute fractions of a percent on a bank CD or something. So we, we know all of that. It's not the easiest thing in the history of the universe, but I think all of us here tonight will tell you that it's very, very satisfying to actually make that change. And I'm sure some of you folks have probably started or completed that process for yourselves as well. Um, another thing that we wanted to talk about is that in Marin, we've had fun doing, and this is back in the old days, <laughs> before the pandemic period, we would do street actions, direct actions, as we call them, where we would get some signs together, you know, get organized, uh, have a little march, um, stand in front of one of the banks. Typically, um, a Chase Bank would be a good candidate. One time we modified the lyrics to a Santana song, and we changed those uh, evil ways lyrics to You've got to change your oily ways, Jamie, before we start banking with you. Um, but in a bigger context, street actions are fun. They energize folks. It feels like you're in the real world. You're not just sitting behind your computer all the time. Um, so that's something to look forward to someday. When we, we Those are things that we could probably pursue now. We would just have to be super cautious about social distancing and masking, et cetera. Um, Miriam, I think, will tell us um, if we ask her a little bit about what uh, young folks have been leading. And one of the things that has happened on the banking side is a, a digital campaign where we actually would go on platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, uh, Google, any place where banks allow you to review them. 
you literally can cut and paste a negative review, maybe with some snarky or not so snarky comments about why don't they finally get around to um, changing their orally ways. I have participated and posted on a number of uh, Twitter accounts. You know, each bank has its own Twitter account sometimes. So that is one of the frontiers of activism that typically young people have been the leaders on. But those of us who are not exactly as young as we used to be, we're learning, we're following, we're using some of those same tools. So that's always fun. So Sandy, why don't we go to the next slide, if you don't mind. So here's benefit. This is a presentation that they have, uh, they placed on Google Docs a year or two ago. And it's, it's six slides. Um, and I just, I'm, I'll give you a little narrative about what I know about Beneficial State. I mean, first of all, it's run by a woman by the name of Kat Taylor. She happens to be the partner of Tom Steyer, the uh, wealthy billionaire who threw his hat in the ring and competed for the Democratic presidential nomination as a pretty progressive guy. And Kat Taylor is, um, she's a very strong, uh, interesting, fun person who has some really um, progressive ideas about particularly serving communities that are underserved generally by the banking industry. I um, mean, if you read about it, we know that there's a giant part of our society that barely has access to banking services at all because they're not seen as profitable clients for banks. Um, so yeah, that's a good one. Why start a bank? Um, so everything about Beneficial State I have found to be admirable. Um, they have a nonprofit ownership structure. And as Sandy mentioned, they are formed as a B, as in boy corporation. Uh, B corporations are very interesting. It's an alternative to the classic C, as in cat corporation, that we know and don't necessarily love all that much. I think we know that the essence of a C corporation is that everything that corporation does is supposed to be focused around one goal, and that goal is maximizing shareholder profits. And that's about it. So the B Corporation is much, much wider in focus. It acknowledges that all of the stakeholders around some kind of entity, and that would be the employees, that would be the communities in which the, that corporation operates. So the shareholders are just one of several stakeholders in a B Corporation. And you can, if, you, if you're setting up an entity of your own, you can find out there's an organization that sort of orchestrates what B Corporations are. They have documents you can use. There are not very many banks beyond Beneficial State that I know of that are set up as a B Corporation. Beneficial, Sandy, yeah, the next one is good as well. So that's about their structure. And they literally, unlike other banks, they have created products specifically for lower income people, for communities that are not well served by banks in general, to make it easy for people who are you know, desperately trying to claw their way up into some kind of financial stability, maybe acquire a car, um, you know, qualify for a car loan, things like that. You'd be surprised at how difficult that is if, you, if you're not in that sweet spot that banks cater to. So I have been with Beneficial now for a couple of years, and um, I have another personal story to tell that sort of underscores their value. I was happy to meet a couple who contacted me through 350 Marin, and uh, the woman in particular was kind of driving, driving the vehicle in a, in a sense. Her husband had some health problems, so they're pretty wealthy, and they had been with the Chase Bank and the um, J.P. Morgan Chase Investment Organization for many years, and they had asked their representative, they had asked the financial professional at their bank. I mean, then they were, you know, they're a seven-figure client, so they you would expect them to get some pretty good customer service. And she had asked many, many, many times, "Would you please make sure that we're not invested in any fossil fuel stocks and so on?" So I'm changing the discussion for a millisecond, but don't worry, I'll bring it back to banking. So when I explained to her that there were ways to change that, that's what I happen to do. I have a business called Green River that actually helps people decarbonize their investment portfolios. So long story short, I helped them exit financial, uh, exit fossil fuel stocks, and they were just as intent about taking their banking services away from Chase as well, because they had seen this report, Banking on Climate Change. They, re they renew that report that Sandy showed you slides of 
every year. Um, so they were just so happy. They thanked me pretty much on a monthly basis. They feel like a weight's been lifted off their shoulders that their financial activities and behaviors and resources are not going to help these folks that are still not doing the right thing, that are funding private prisons, that are funding extreme fossil fuel projects like the tar sands, like deep water drilling. And it's a very, there's a very simple reason why the big banks loan to these extreme projects. It's because they can charge a very high interest rate since they're the only ones that have the size to make those loans and that are willing because they really don't care about anything since they're a C-Corp other than lining the pockets of the shareholders. Uh, so that's about all I have to say about this. Uh, thank you folks once again for inviting us and I'll turn it back over to David. Thank you so, so much. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we're gonna touch on a little bit tonight is um, I know that in my youth, when I was thinking about um, many decades ago, uh, thinking about moving my money to credit unions, there were these myths that were out there that if you removed your money to a credit union, you weren't going to get as much money from the interest in your savings account, that the, the, the fees were going to be high. You weren't Basically, you weren't going to get a great deal that you would get from a mega bank because these mega banks had huge resources and could offer you, you know, not just toasters when you open the account, but all these amazing things. And the, the thing that's interesting is it's not true. Um, it, very often, you'll find that you'll get a better deal at a community bank or at um, a credit union. And I did the research when I was sort of looking around at the credit unions. The, the, the nice thing about credit unions on some level is you can't make a, a bad mistake going to a credit union because they're all so interconnected that you can use um, the, the ATM network. You can go to any of the credit, uh, credit unions and very often you can go into a different credit union, do banking, um, even though it's not your credit union. You need to check first, of course, um, to, to make sure. But um, you know, there are these myths that make it so that we have that in the back of our minds because we've heard this, uh, you know, decades ago. That oh, you know, yes, it's probably you know a socially responsible thing to do, but it's really going to you know hurt my bottom line. And the short answer is, is it won't. And the thing that's also interesting is a lot of the conveniences that we assume are only available at, at the mega banks are actually available at all these community banks and the credit unions as well. So all the things that you can do at your big bank, you can pretty much do at the credit union. You should check, you should confirm when you go that the, the conveniences that are especially important to you, you should absolutely make sure that they're available at the credit union, but you don't let that be a preventative um, a hurdle that gets you to not even begin the process, which is what the big banks want. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that, <clears throat> I think some people have in the back of their minds is that, oh, credit unions are the, is this different thing. My, you know, my Bank of America accounts are all federally insured and protected, and no matter you know when the world blows up or whatever, um, my money is safe there. Not to worry. In a regular checking and savings account at, at a credit union or at a community bank, it also is going to be federally insured. You, you should always, you know, ask when you go in, making sure that you're getting into the right kind of accounts but don't let that be a hurdle to you beginning the process of looking around. <clears throat> uh, okay, so last time that this team got together and gave one of these presentations, uh, Miriam was uh, beginning the process of, of moving her money. And so it was really wonderful. We got to sort of talk about the process of, um, uh, of the various steps that she was gonna have to undertake. And now she's gone through the process. So I'm hoping is that as I go through the, sort of some of the steps to moving your money out of a big bank, um, that she'll chime in and talk about her own personal experiences, uh, each of these steps now, um, which I think is gonna be great. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay. Okay, so this is the slide um, that Sandy showed before. And I think this is really important because while we're all environmentally focused in this room, um, there are just so many reasons to leave mega banks. And so when you start having those conversations with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family, um, and if an environmental or climate crisis isn't, you know, the, their number one issues, if they care about 
firearms and they want to know that actually Wells Fargo is the banker for the National Rifle Association. Um, I don't know what, what what's going to happen when they move. Um, but, uh, you know, that might resonate with someone else. So, so this is a, a, a really good checklist to kind of see. It's a little bit outdated. It's 2017. But to be honest with you, it's, things haven't changed that much. And, um, uh, you know, Sandy commented a little bit before, um, there's this notion of greenwashing, right, where um, a, a financial institution will um, will sort of talk about um, all the amazing things they're doing around uh, a, a, a changing in light of an environmental crisis. But really, we've seen that, especially those top four that Sandy referenced, they're, they're not changing anything at all of, of real substance. One of the things that I found fascinating is that credit unions and community banks you know, their focus is really on investing the community that they're in. I don't understand. Mega banks, uh, on, on average, invest only 4% of their assets in the community that they reside in, which just, that just stunned me. And so if you really are a, sort of a community-based person, uh, understand the importance of community, that, that alone is a great reason to, to, to get out. Okay, so... <clears throat> This other PDF that I'm sharing with you now, it, again, it's a little bit outdated. And I, I think uh, Patrick and Sandy both sort of um, hinted at um, the world of financial institutions is really shifting pretty quickly these days. And so you really do need to do your own research. Um, we'll, we're happy to share this. This is mainly about Berkeley because we're this came out of our uh, campaign here in Berkeley. <clears throat> but a lot of these uh, credit unions are available um, you know, in the broader Bay Area. So this this side uh, of this form, um, what we've done is we've kind of gone through a listing of some of the credit unions. The one at the bottom, Use Credit Union, is the one I go to. I'm not promoting it. It's a perfectly good credit union. I'm really happy with it. When we moved um, our finances um, out of Wells Fargo, uh, we moved it to use, and that was our personal account, and I have two businesses as well, and we moved, so uh, several checking accounts and a savings account, and at that time, it was a good moment uh, in the market to refinance our home, and so we moved our um, mortgage from Wells Fargo over to use credit union. Not all credit unions offer mortgage services. Sometimes it's sort of subcontracted out. Use does, um, and so it was especially good fit for us. So what we did is we kind of took a look at a number of factors um, of credit unions. You know, the cost of, of, of a checking account, the cost of a savings account in terms of a minimum that you have to open it with. Um, what about their um, the, the cost of using an ATM that's not connected um, to the network, or if it is part of the larger uh, credit union, is it free? A uh, network is it free? Um, are they? Um, do they allow for online and mobile banking? Do they, where do they have branches? Do they have branches in Berkeley, or close to uh, to where I live? Um, those things can be really important. I think we're all finding that it's less important now. Uh, beneficial bank. Um, which um, Patrick discussed, um, we're moving a nonprofit account into that. We don't even have to go in. It's amazing. We just have to send our forms in, you know, the corporate bylaws, the all of the 501c3 information, the minutes that say who the officers are, and that's it. It takes about a month to do it because it's a, it's a sort of a nonprofit business account, but uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and then what kind of services that they offer? Do they offer home loans, car loans, um, business, do they offer IRAs? Oh, we also moved four different IRA accounts over to uh, use credit union as well. Um, uh, uh, Patrick might want to talk a little bit about the CDFI. It's a little bit complicated and it's not always an accurate reflection of investments, um, but we can, we can talk about it if people are interested. I'm going to flip the page over and even though this looks a lot like what I was showing you before, this is community-based banking, local banks, um, so beneficial is on here, number two, and it's got a B by it, which you can see is a, um, it means that it's a B Corp. There's another one down below, New Resource Bank. I think they might have changed the name since 2017, which is when we did this one. But again, this kind of chart can really help guide you in terms of collecting information, the things that are important to you, and um, have, helping you make a decision about what kind of bank that you're going to um, switch to. Um, 
I don't know if Miriam, if you want to kind of um, weigh in at all about the process of whether you wanted to join a credit union versus a um, a community bank, the concept of um, a, a, a bank that is uh, has a brick and mortar um, outlets or whether really an online banking is a, a virtual bank was, was good for you. Do you want to talk at all about that? Sure, I can jump in. So for myself, when I was looking at banks, one of the most important things for me was that my bank could move with me. Um, and perhaps that was one of the reasons that originally I ended up in Wells Fargo, um, aside from the fact my parents chose it for me. And as a result, choosing a community bank was not necessarily the choice that I wanted just because I would likely have to change my home bank were I to move across the country in a couple of years as I'm somewhat young and in a situation where I don't necessarily know where I want to settle down long term. And so for me, that kind of eliminated a whole category of those like local banks. Um, and unfortunately also required me to let go of this idea of like a B Corp that might be investing in my local community. And I ultimately ended up set, settling with Amalgamated, which was a online bank, allowing me to kind of think about banking as something that I didn't have to worry about regardless of where I lived. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is um, share actually I'm gonna stop this share and share. Um, we sort of set up 10 steps um, that, we, that we recommend that you kind of thoughtfully go through the process of changing. So I'm gonna just rip through them really fast and then we'll kind of weigh in and have um, Miriam also talk about her process. So um, the first one is ch choosing which bank you wanna to go to or credit union, um, talking to them, making sure um, that all of the, your assumptions that you had about them, all of the things that you counted on um, at your other bank are gonna, are gonna be um, provided for, for you at this one. Um, and then opening your new account, um, making a list of all your automatic payments and withdrawals. Patrick talked a little bit about his process there with Beneficial doing that. Um, and I, I found that one of the things that I find really interesting is we all assume that a lot of our automatic withdrawals and deposits are done on a monthly basis, but that's not always true. Um, I have some insurance withdrawals that happen on a quarterly basis. I've got, I think my gym membership was like a year yearly thing. So you do sort of have to pay attention um, to, to those things um, uh, as you um, begin the process of, of moving everything uh, over to your new account. So moving those automatic withdrawals over to your new account is important. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting is, um, you know, you need um, access to financial transaction history quite often. This can pop up with taxes, sometimes in back years of taxes. If you, you know, if you're like me, I stopped getting printed um, statements ages ago. Um, once you shut down your bank account, you'll still have access to those statements, but only for a limited amount of time. And you should check actually with your mega bank. How, you know, how long will I have access to that? How long, you know, after I leave the bank? Um, and uh, if whatever, whatever the limitation is, you might consider downloading those uh, bank statements. The nice thing is you can do it usually by PDF. You don't have to print out, you know, waste hundreds of pages on a printer. You can usually download it as a PDF. But if, if having that kind of arch archival history is important to you, you might want to check with your CPA or if anyone helps you file taxes or a bookkeeper, ask them if they need that kind of information. That's an important step as well. Um, and then of course, the final step of transferring, transferring the remaining funds from your old bank account into your new one, uh, and then closing your, your, your old bank account. You would think that that's the last step. We really um, want to stress that that last step, which is informing your big bank why you're leaving. It's really important to send that message and you can, you can share it with your local branch, but also sending it to um, the, the, the board um, that governs that bank is a really important um, step as well. Uh, we used to have, I think Sandy, um, a sample of a letter um, 
I don't, I probably have it somewhere. I don't have it to present tonight, but we can share that um, to be sent out in an email if people are interested. Um, is that something you have on the Fossil Free California site or anything? Yeah, we have we have the uh, sample letter on uh, the Fossil Free California Move Your Money page. I'll put the link in the chat. It's really satisfying to hand over that letter and have the, it, it's, uh, it just makes you feel uh, quite, quite powerful and good. And also to send it to headquarters, to send a letter to Jamie Dimon and tell him why you're leaving Chase. It's, uh, it does get the attention of uh, headquarters as well, and the local bank is just fine. I felt kind of nervous about breaking up with my bank, but it, you know, when I got to that point uh, and handed over the letter, that was just right. Excellent. Um, I do wanna share um, uh, another screen, which is this wonderful website um, that uh, I think Sandy and Patrick sh uh, shared with me, which is, if you're not sure what local banks are available to you, there's this wonderful website called banklocal.info. Um, and you basically put in your information. Um, let's say you live in Santa Rosa, you just put in Santa Rosa, it comes up with some options here and you click Santa Rosa, it cranks its wheels and up pops bank. And the nice thing is, Sandy, you can you can actually talk about this, but the way it ranks these when it comes up with this list. Isn't uh, uh, Sandy the the or the impact um, order reflects the aggregate score of their algorithm talking about local impact, how well banks in the community contribute to the health of the local community, which I just love. So the way it ranks it is the ones that have the best impact are ranked first. So if you wanna take a look at Summit Bank, State Bank, for instance, or Redwood Credit Union, you just click on it and it zooms in and you can see where all the different branches are, where ATMs are. And if you wanna see a more detailed information, you can say, show full bank account. I mean, this is, this is you know, the kind of thing that we used to have to wander around the streets of Berkeley uh, to get a lot of this information and it's a, a click of the button. So um, uh, banklocal.info can really be a great resource um, to, to helping guide you in that search. And the nice thing is they keep this up to date in a way that my list of community banks, um, you know, that's from a couple of years ago and things really do change in the, in the banking uh, in the banking world. Um, let's go back to that list of 10 um, items that I kind of breezed through. And um, I don't know, Miriam, if you wanna talk about any of the other steps that you, that you went through besides just how you chose um, uh, your bank, but any of the other uh, steps that you went through and some of the issues that you uh, encountered and, and basically success stories, hurdles, things that other people might gain from you sharing your, your process. Yeah, absolutely. So you've heard a little bit about um, some of my colleagues who've done switches of banks that are in like local areas and they had the opportunity to go into a physical bank location um, in that process. And I think that that might be the biggest thing that was different for me in this process is that I did it entirely online. I have yet to go into a bank location during this entire process and I have not yet closed my mega bank account, um, but I've been waiting for that whole COVID wave to die off a little bit. So I don't feel quite as nervous about that walking into a bank. <laughs> um, but going back, um, it was a little bit interesting opening an account entirely online. It took a couple days as I went back and forth with them to get all the security things rather than them stamping it in person and you walk out the door with your bank account open. I submitted the first step of information online. They verified it. I got back a couple days later with the information that it was verified. And then I took the next step. Um, and actually opening a joint account was the same way where I had to open my account and then once it was completely set up and verified, add, add the joint person. And I think that's probably specific to Amalgamated, um, but just being aware that if you are doing it online, you might not be able to sit down and do the entire thing in 30 minutes. You may have 
five five minute sessions of opening your bank instead. Um, the other thing that I encountered that was a little bit challenging um, was just the process of waiting for cards to come. And I think unfortunately mine was made more challenged um, by all the post, post office um, snafus in December as I was trying to open my bank. I was also handling the hurdles of COVID post office. So it took like a month for things to be delivered, but understanding how everyone's mail was slowed down and crazy. I don't think that was an issue with opening the bank so much as just the fact I was trying to open a bank account using the mail services during December of COVID. Um, overall, that went all very smoothly. And every time I called online or called their phone lines, they were very responsive. I had very little wait time and they were very able to answer questions. Um, I think that the other thing that I was suddenly aware of though in this whole process of opening and calling and saying, hey, this is, this is my next question, et cetera, was that I was working off of Eastern Standard Time because the bank is based in Eastern Standard Time. And even though I was online banking, the phone lines are still your normal workday hours. So wasn't intuitive to me, although I think maybe for others that might be true. Um, yeah. I think that's all I have to share, but if others have thoughts about it, I'm happy to pitch more in. Thank you. One of the um, FAQs that we have here is something that doesn't feel like it's really, you know, an issue for us in the middle of a pandemic, but it is the kind of thing that you want to pay attention to, which is, um, you know, uh, what kind of issues might you have if you if you do a lot of international traveling? Do you want to make sure that you have access to your money while you're abroad? Um, I, I think, uh, again, uh, credit unions and community banks really are, have similar issues to any of the mega banks, but it is an important thing that if you are traveling, you want to make sure that you're not going to be surprised while you're abroad um, doing this. Um, the one thing that we haven't really talked about here very much, again, um, Sandy touched on it, um, is the credit card thing that can be a little bit trickier. People are really wet, especially, you know, when we used to travel, <laughs> um, really wedded to their mileage, you know, accounts, they love to get miles um, on their credit cards. And that's a hard thing to, to people just don't want to switch their credit cards, because they, they don't want to give up their miles. And so you might want to look into um, keeping, you might want to keep a credit card, but just get a new one to charge on it. Um, and that way you can save the miles that you had on your old one. Um, and Beneficial Bank has just come out with its own credit card at the end of last year. So all of the investments behind that um, are all part of its B Corp strategy. So it's not going to be invested in things that you don't want. I haven't gotten um, the, the Beneficial credit card yet, but when we open up our nonprofit, we're really um, looking forward to ditching our, I think it was a Bank of America card behind, which we know every time we use it, we just feel guilty. Um, because we're putting, you know, the, the money is going to be uh, used by something that we don't, really don't want it to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. I don't have a lot more to say. I don't know if Sandy and Patrick or Miriam want to weigh in. We certainly are open to questions. Is now a good time to open it up, Sandy, do you think? Yeah, I think it would be good. There are a number of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know that I can see all of them, but I'll try to roll through and pick out some yeah. questions. And the, the top um, one is an interesting one. Um, you know, the one about uh, B of A kind of stepping up and um, uh, uh, is helping out in a sort of a, a, a financial dispute. Um, I, that's a good question about whether a community bank um, or a, a credit union might be willing to do, to do that. Often it's that's in the realm of credit cards. So I don't know, um, Lynn, if that was if that was a Bank of America credit card was associated with that, or if it was really just through the bank. I don't know if Lynn Deckard is busy. Yeah. She's uh, speak up, please, if you <laughs> if you are with within the sound of our voice. I think, um, you know, so I would say that the. Um, that might be a good conversation to have in general with your bank. Uh, my guess is they're not going to be able to give you a specific answer on a sort of what if kind of question, but there may be, um, that may be a good conversation to have around the credit card.
Louise Discarud uh, asked about public banks and sad to say the public banks are still in the developmental stage. Uh, the public bank as such is legal in California and uh, Los Angeles might be the first public bank in California. We have a slide that has a list of a few online banks and community banks and I will find that slide or you can go to the Move Your Money page on Fossil Free California's website. If I can recall them, there's an online bank called Aspiration, there's Miriam's bank that she chose amalgamated, there's uh, Self-Help Federal Credit Union, Beneficial State Bank, those are the main ones. Yeah, that's a good slide. So this is the one that's the, the one that are the local community banks as opposed to the credit unions. Uh, right. This is the credit union one. And again, we're happy to send this um, to the, the, the team if you guys wanna share it amongst yourselves. Oh, here's a question that I would so love to answer. Who's personally done the most recent research regarding banks? What did your research reveal regarding Bank of the West? Um, Bank of the West is uh, a question that I have followed for a few years. And Bank of the West is owned by BNP Paribas, um, a French bank. So, BNP Paribas has been making pledges and claiming various levels of greenness for some time. And they are in some ways at the policy level, pretty progressive. It almost looks like they might uh, restrict lending to fossil fuel projects, but the research done by Rainforest Action Network still shows them about in the middle of the pack. Uh, Rainforest Action Network lists the top 35 banks that lend to fossil fuel projects and uh, BNP Paribas is number 17. So they're not all the way clean. They do make a lot of um, publicity statements about their intentions. Someone also asked about Mechanics Bank and the fact that it's been purchased by a billionaire out of Texas. Um, which is true. Um, that happened a number of years ago. Um, what I've told my friends who bank at mechanics is that right now, um, there's nothing that indicates that they are moving away from being sort of that community kind of bank, um, investing in the local community and not investing a lot of things that um, we wouldn't want them investing in. Um, but because of this change of ownership, that could change on a dime. So you really have to kind of keep your ear to the ground if you have your money in, in, in Mechanics Bank. So if you just want to stop thinking about it and you want to move your money to a, a, um, a B Corp bank like Beneficial or a credit union, you know, that there's no reason not to do that. There's just not a compelling reason to move. It's not as though Mechanics Bank is, is investing in things you don't want to at this moment. And, and I'll, I'll admit, I've actually not kept my ear to the ground in the last year or so. So I, I have no uh, recent information. I don't know if Patrick and Sandy want to share any information about that. Um, there's another question. Do any of your suggested banks contribute 1% for the planet? I think Beneficial State Bank does. And I know for sure that a new online bank called Atmos it contributes 1% for the planet. Atmos uh, is just coming online, so to speak. And they have a savings account and various other products that they'll be rolling out. There's a question no. above about signature verification that I think we skipped. And I don't personally have a mortgage, so I can't speak to mortgages in particular. But I have found that um, Amalgamated is quite rigorous in their security protocol. Um, and so I imagine that they do have several layers of security around payments of that type. 
um, for me in order to log into my bank. If I'm logging in from a new location, even if it's on my own computer, I have to enter the password, receive a phone call and enter the uh, code that they have called into my phone on the computer in order to log in. Um, and they do have very strict limits on how many times you can mess up the password as I myself have messed up my own password enough to discover that. Um, would recommend knowing your password. So that was, that was really um, encouraging to, my, to me when I was opening an online account. Uh, thank you, Doug, for that information. Uh, so Doug wrote, Beneficial does not participate in the 1% for the pan, uh, plan, but Bank of the West does. Um, does anybody else have any, have we skipped any questions? I think, I think we've answered most of them. Um, I have a, I have a question if I could ask it without typing. You can, yes, please. <laughs> okay, great. I'm a lazy typer. Yeah. Hi, my name is Cheryl, and I just moved to the Bay from Sacramento, and I'd been thinking I needed to get a bank that I could walk into, but you've made me realize that, by golly, I have a, I'm in a credit union in Sacramento, so if I can get rid of the notion that I need to walk into a branch, it'd probably be great to stay there. So thank you for that. And then my question, and... I have a credit card through big old Bank of America. So if I were to get a credit card through Beneficial State Bank, do you think that my money would be used in a more planet friendly way, as far as you know? The short answer is yes, but unfortunately Beneficial credit card is only, they only give it out if you have an account at Beneficial. Uh -huh. Well, I'm glad Beneficial finally came out with their credit card. Uh, the company that backs my bank is called TCM Bank, and it's part of an independent banker's network. Uh, the, and you can get a, a credit card through them. You can you even get uh, points and prizes if you wish to. And it's it's been fine. And my uh Impression is that TCM Bank does not bank with, does not lend to fossil fuel projects. That was part of their premise. When they supported the Sierra Club credit card years ago or, and other affinity cards, it was because, oh, they're endorsed by Green America. I don't know if you follow Green America. Um, they have a whole section on their website about green banking and they have lots of other wonderful resources. Let me just put that in the chat, greenamerica.org. So that was good enough for me. And it was so hard for me to give up my mileage plus credit card, <laughs> but uh, it's still, it's worth it. I like, we had a question about if um, uh, a community bank makes loans for gas burning cars, and emissions heavy homes, is that really fossil free? Well, no, but <laughs> you can cut off the, lo the, uh, the loans to the first part of the fossil free emissions chain, uh, a highly significant part on the, on the supply side rather than the consumption side. Yeah, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a great question here for- um, David, David, let me weigh in for a second. You know, I think one of the things we have to be realistic about, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I, I do see a lot of people on the left who seem to take great joy in finding one little thing that's not perfect about some new suggested, you know, positive change. I, we just have to be a little more sophisticated than that. We're not going to change any of these things overnight. So finding a bank that you know makes special products just for underserved communities doesn't loan money to private prisons and weapons manufacturers and fossil fuel organizations that's a big thing and you know maybe they're not perfect on every we can always take it to an, the next level you know where was the car manufactured how did that electricity that they use how was it created i mean people kind of get a little too carried away in my personal opinion so let's not, <laughs> let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good 
Good point. Um, Do any of you uh, have a Sierra, a current Sierra Club credit card? Because Cheryl McKinney wants to know which bank handles Sierra Club credit card. And I don't know personally at this point. No, can't tell you. Does anyone have an REI credit card? That's another hot button for me. REI uh, credit card, their MasterCard is uh, backed by US Bank and US Bank uh, is not, not a huge Wall Street bank, but it certainly lends plenty of money to fossil fuel projects. There's been a whole campaign to get REI to change its credit card, but it hasn't worked so far. Someone um, asked about um, uh, public banks in San Francisco and also in the East Bay, and they are going to be really, really important. Probably not directly to us as individuals for a while. Really, the focus is going to be on things like, um, so for instance, Berkeley. In, we've had a really difficult time moving Berkeley away from Wells Fargo, partly just because there are so many services offered to a, a, a municipality um, that really they need um, that a community bank or a credit union just can't offer. But a public bank will be able to. And so what we're going to see is that things around affordable housing, things around municipal finances, um, things like um, banking in the marijuana industry, right? I mean, it's, it's because it's not federally legal yet. Um, if you are running a, a dispensary, um, where do you put your money? And public banks, um, I think one of the big reasons that the public banks finally passed um, was because they realized we have this major industry in California that needed to, a place to put its money and public banks are gonna be part of that solution. So um, probably not so much to us as individuals for a while, but really important to support. Well, the public banks are intended to partner with community banks so that uh, individuals can get their retail banking services. So I think it's gonna be part of a nice system as it, as it fleshes out. Yeah. How's our time, Liz? Um, it's 8.44. Yeah, yeah, 8.44, 8 8.45. Um, we usually run until, you know, nine o'clock or thereabouts, or as, or as long as we feel like it. Sometimes we, you know, go on until 10. <laughs> That's the nice thing about Zoom is we can just come and go whenever we want. Okay. But if, <laughs> if, if there are more questions, though, let's uh, proceed. Um, I, I would like to ask a question. This is Louise Diskarud. Uh, I've been trying to use the chat line, but people are not understanding what I'm asking or I'm not asking it correctly or skipping my questions. Um, I did ask a question about Discover Online Bank and I didn't. I don't seem to have seen it on your slides. Is there any number, that's the number one question. Is there any information on that particular bank? Not for me, I don't know it. Okay, I'll just have to do more research. So then I think you misinterpreted my question back uh, when you were trying to answer it. And I apologize for not maybe asking it appropriately and typing it in. Uh, what I was not asking about public banks, I was asking about these community banks that there was a list I uh, had asked to have that slide put back up so that I could take a screenshot. But um, instead of trying to figure out where to go and find them all. Um, but my real question was, if oh. I would want to switch to one of those in this area, what, and I, I don't plan on staying here forever in California. So if I, let's say I move somewhere else in another state, would that be a problem continuing with that bank, uh, being a community bank in another state is really what I was trying to ask. I think the short answer is no. If they have adequate online banking services, you can certainly um, take your business. Uh, to, you can be located in any state and continue your banking business. I, I think one thing that's important to ask is um, 
if, for instance, in my businesses, if I get a check that is more than $5,000 that, that I want to deposit, I cannot deposit that with mobile banking. So if I don't have the ability to go into a, a bank and do it that way, um, I'd have to mail it in. And so um, the, the rules are, have been changing a little bit because of the COVID crisis, in, interestingly enough. But my guess is that they're going to go back to that. So that's a post 9-11 like terrorist financing law um, that they really just don't want large chunks of money um, being deposited into bank accounts that they can't actually tr track really um, easily. So I would say, you know, ask your bank, say, if I don't, if I can't do this, I'm, are there gonna be limitations to the fact that I can't walk into this branch here in the Bay Area if I'm gonna be in, you know, upstate Connecticut or something? Thank you. Yeah, there are these big, you know, the networks now that banks are linked into, for example, right across the street from my office is a U.S. bank. I can use their ATM to withdraw or deposit money for beneficial state. So it's a giant organization. I know it goes beyond California. I don't know if it covers all 50 states. I put two links in the chat just recently. One is about the California Public Banking Alliance. You know, there's, there, I'm, I track public banking for 350 Marin. And there are a lot of exciting things happening in that realm. Um, AOC, a couple of the squad on the federal level are proposing a federal public bank. And there's a, a bill that had some discussion in 2020, and it's going to come up to be discussed again in the California legislature about creating a California state public bank. But as Sandy said, also, there's also regional groups. Uh, the San Francisco has one, Alameda has one, San Diego, I believe, Los Angeles. And it's a little technical. I mean, you know how we're protected up to 250,000 per account? Well, you can imagine if a community is gonna deposit all of its money, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars with a bank, they wanna be assured that if, some, if the banking industry goes awry, that they can somehow get their assets back. So that's really the biggest challenge about public banks they have to be capitalized with a certain amount of money somewhere. And one of the things people are thinking about right now is to use union pension fund deposits could be a way to capitalize public banks. So it's, it's a lot going on. There's new news every week about public banking. And I also, I've also put in a link to that um, flyer that we showed listing the banks, the good banks and the bad banks, so to speak, on both sides in the chat. Louise, did you want me to post that um, screen again of the public banks and the credit unions? Not public banks, community banks. We will send it around and it can be shared with your mailing list. So that's something Liz can probably do. We'll, and we'll people, that sorry, info. I was gonna say, yes, it would be very helpful. I, I, I'm tired of trying to follow links and everything else that, you know, my, that's all I do all day long at work. I'm kind of tired of it. So <laughs> that, yeah, thank you. It's just easier this way. I appreciate that so much. Nice job. Thank you. And then here's the, this is, this is the uh, local banks, the community banks. Again, this is pretty outdated. Um, we, Sandy and a group of us did this a while back and we haven't really updated it. And the fact that, you know, some of you are coming to us and talking about banks that we haven't even heard of um, is an indicator of how much that's sort of shifting. Oh, here's a, here's a question or a comment. Uh, Jackie Fielder, who ran for state Senate uh, was super involved in getting a public bank in San Francisco. There's still not a public bank in San Francisco, but uh, they're still working on it. And Jackie Fielder is one of my personal heroes. So I uh, expect that there will be a public bank in San Francisco. You know, and the whole idea of a public bank is you have a community group of people who make decisions about how loans are made, how much to charge. And it's not all about fattening the wallets of a few shareholders like it is with commercial banks. Oh, 
Okay, are there any more questions, comments? Uh, okay, hearing none. Um, people are welcome to, you know, just uh, loiter and chit chat some more if they want. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, I want to very much thank uh, Miriam, Sandy, David, um, uh, and, Patrick. and your whole crew, and Patrick. Thank you. Sorry, Patrick. Yeah, I thank all of you. This has been just absolutely fascinating and Absolutely. extremely helpful. And uh, now we're all going to go out and move our money, right? And questions can be directed at info at fossilfreeca.org, right, Sandy and Miriam? Right. And if you have questions about uh, investments um, sort of outside of the direct sort of bank account world, um, feel free to send them to that uh, because Patrick, this is Patrick's area of expertise and he can he can help guide you that way. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.